Well, good evening. Glad to have you with us tonight. Glad to have those here here in person. I've only got 15 minutes. They told me I got to hurry up and get done. So, <laughs> I promise I'm not split screen on my iPad tonight. So, welcome to you there watching on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, all those things. Be sure to heart, like, share, uh, and then also welcome to those who are on our phone live streaming there. Thank you for joining with us. If you have access to our church website, go to highlandbaptistchurch.com. It's under the info tab. You can get the bulletin there. Uh, upcoming activities are in that, so be sure to get that, as well as our children's worship bulletins. Download that or send those links uh, to anybody that you want to. And also under that info tab, you can get the latest uh, prayer list. We have a new one that'll be coming out Wednesday, so you especially want to check that uh, on Wednesday, as we have several uh, who have some upcoming surgeries uh, that you'll want to remember. Uh, and then also while you're there on the church website, go to the far right hand side, click the Give Online tab. You can do your online giving there, uh, your regular giving, the offering for Lottie Moon Christmas offering for the international missions. So be sure to take the time to do that. And again, don't forget uh, about the Hoosier One. We've got those cards down here in front. If you've not done that, please do that. Tear off this sheet with the name on the back of it, put it in the offering plate. Uh, we'll record the names and then we'll get that on the, the cross over here. I think we've got 21 I counted uh, this morning that we have on the cross that we're praying for right now. So praise the Lord for that. That's my 15 minutes. So, no, Mike, come on, you can lead us in singing. <laughs> we'll sing all 24 verses. <clears throat> Okay, take your Bibles, if you will. Uh, hopefully you have those out and ready to go. Genesis chapter 17 is where we're at tonight in our uh, study through the book of Genesis. We want you to help you to understand uh, Genesis more fully. Uh, and so I've entitled this message tonight as we look at chapter 17, What's in a Name? 
And you're going to see that as we go through the passage here, the different names that we're going to recognize as we go through Genesis chapter 17. Uh, so we're just going to begin, if you will, with verse 1 down through verse 3. So let's stand as we read God's word in honor of his word. Genesis 17, verse 1 through verse 3. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word tonight. Lord, so much that's in this one powerful chapter. I pray, God, that we would understand what's in a name. That our name, many times, represents our, our, uh, our character. And so, Father, I pray that as we examine our own hearts and our own lives, may we uplift the name of Jesus. We profess to be Christians. Uh, we take the name of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that we would reflect Christ in our hearts and in our lives. So bless this word tonight, make it powerful, make it alive, make it sharper than any two-edged sword. Use it, Lord, in our hearts in a powerful way uh, to bring us closer to you and to bring those who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior to faith in him uh, this evening. Father, we ask your blessings in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. You know, at some point in your education... You may have read Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, or at least seen uh, the movie, uh, and you discovered in Acts 2 that famous quotation, what's in a name, that which we call a, a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. Juliet spoke those words uh, as she was out on her balcony. She didn't know that Romeo was down below listening. She was thinking about the fact that she belonged to the Capulet family and he belonged to the rival family, the Montagues, and that this accident of birth hindered them from getting married as the two were opposed to one another and that was just forbidden. So what difference did two names make? Well, no matter what his name was, Romeo was still her love. Now, Shakespeare notwithstanding, if you had asked a biblical character the question, what's in a name, uh, that person would have replied from the Old Testament scriptures that everything is in a person's name. Our names are very important. There's an old saying that says every man has three names. One his father and mother gave him, one others call him, and the one he acquires himself. You know, names might record something significant in the Old Testament about uh, one's birth or about some life-changing experience. Now, we don't always think that way in our culture here uh, in naming of our children, but you think about Jacob. Jacob, you find out in the Scriptures, he uh, was renamed. Uh, his name meant deceiver, supplanter. Uh, and, and so Jacob was eventually in his life renamed Israel uh, after a night of wrestling with God. You read in the New Testament that uh, Simon Peter, uh, he received, he was called Simon before, uh, he was named Peter uh, when he met Jesus Christ. He was called the rock, the little rock. And, and so many times throughout the Bible, the names assigned to unborn babies even carried messages. Uh, in this chapter, in chapter 17 here, we're going to see here in these verses uh, that th there are four names that we're going to discover here, and there's a name that will always be old because it cannot be changed. So the first thing I want you to see is God Almighty in verse 1 through verse 3. So this is a declaration, if you will, of the person of God. So at this point in the Genesis story, it's been quite a long time since that initial speaking of God to Abraham to tell him to get out of his country and to go uh, to this place he's going to show him. It's been a while even since he, he spoke to God, God spoke to him uh, and appeared to him. And so uh, he had spoken to him in visions, he had spoken to him in dreams, but now he appears to Abraham, and he does a very strange thing. He identifies himself, as verse 1 says. So when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. 
Now that may seem strange at first, because obviously Abraham would have known who God was just by the sound of his voice. But God had a special purpose in identifying himself to Abram. He calls himself by a special name. Now that special name tells us at least two things about God. First, it tells us that he deserves our confidence. Because understand this, God identifies himself as God Almighty. It's the first time that this name is ever used in, for God in the Bible. This name in the Hebrew is the words El Shaddai. You may have heard the words El Shaddai before. Uh, there is even a song that includes that in it. Uh, the name El is the name for God, which means literally the God of power. The name Shaddai literally means to be strong. And so when you put them together, the name literally means the God who can do anything. Now, theologian, theolo theologians have a term for this called omnipotence. Omnipotence simply means all-powerful. That term is thrown around rather loosely sometimes, and sometimes it's used to mean something different than the biblical meaning of the term. You see, to say that God is omnipotent is not to say God can do anything, because if God could do anything, then God could die, or God could lie. But of course, we know that God can't do either one of those things. So when we say that God is omnipotent, we mean that God can do anything that would not deny his character or defy his power or decry his truthfulness. So if God is omnipotent, there is nothing he cannot do. And if that is so, then obviously he is the only one who deserves our complete confidence, and our complete trust. So think about it. You have any rivers in your life that, uh, that you think are uncross uncrossable, any situations or circumstances? You have any mountains of problems in your life that, that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things uh, that are thought to be impossible. He does things that others cannot do. So if God is this kind of God then it's shameful and it's even sinful. It is just plain stupid of us, if you will, not to put all of your faith and all of your trust in him. The second thing his name tells us is also that he deserves our commitment. He deserves our commitment. So verse 17 says, I am God Almighty, walk before me, and be blameless. So because God is all-powerful, because God is omnipotent, and because there's nothing that God cannot do uh, that would defy his character, then he, cannot, uh, th then he not only deserves our commitment, he also has the right to demand our commitment. So he says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. So in these verses here, uh, he's, he's speaking to him uh, about a covenant. Verse 2 goes on to say uh, that I make my, may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So that phrase, my covenant, is used nine times in this chapter and defines God's relationship with Abraham. This wasn't just any other covenant. It was different from the one God had already established with Abraham. It was a reaffirmation of that covenant. Uh, it wasn't a new covenant, if you will. And so with this important addition of, uh, as we'll see here, he's going to add circumcision to it. Let's just continue to read a few verses here to see what he says. Uh, he, he goes on to tell him uh, that he, they will have to uh, add circumcision uh, to, their, to the things that they're doing. It says in verse 10, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And then he continues on. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, in just a moment. But that circumcision was a sign. It was a seal of the covenant. It's sort of like what we as New Testament believers do today with baptism. 
Uh, baptism is a picture, a sign of what has happened in our hearts and our lives when we've trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, we don't get saved by baptism. It shows the picture of the salvation that's already happened through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For them in the Old Testament, the circumcision was a sign to the rest of the world. They were set apart from the rest of the world, a sign that they were committed to God. So God promised once again there to multiply Abraham's family, even though he and his wife didn't have any children. He tells them that his descendants would be as the dust of the earth, as the stars of the heaven. Now that seems inconceivable for us, because what did it say about Abram in the very first verse? He was 99 years old at this point. And so God says, your, your descendants are going to be as the dust of the earth, as the stars of the heavens. Somebody once said, God being all he is and me being what I am tells me that no sacrifice I could make for God is too great. As the great hymn uh, says, when I survey the wondrous cross by uh, Isaac Watts, it says he deserves our life, he deserves our soul, he deserves our all. Abraham made just that kind of commitment and gave God that kind of confidence. How do we know that? Because look again at verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he tripped and fell on his face. We do that sometimes. In the Bible, falling on the face is a, is a position of submission. When a person falls on their face before God, here's what they're literally saying. They're saying, I'm all ears. I'm going to believe whatever you say, and I'm going to do whatever I'm told. You know, one of the greatest principles that you'll ever learn from the Bible is this, is that faith honors God, but God honors faith. God honored Abram's faith with his faithfulness. And so we see the name of God here. The first time the word God Almighty is used to remind us of God's powerfulness and that there is nothing that is impossible for him. The second name we come to is Abraham or Abram. So in verse 3, it says, again, that Abram <clears throat> fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Now think about this. He, has no, he only has uh, one child. We've uh, talked about that with Sarah and, and Hagar uh, in the previous chapter, Ishmael. Uh, but this isn't, he's already told him that's not the one who's going to fulfill the covenant promise. And so here he's telling him, here's the covenant, but he doesn't even have a kid to fulfill the covenant at this point. He says, you're going to be the father of a multitude of nations. Verse 5, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Verse 8, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, uh, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which, shall, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money uh, from any foreigner who is not your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought uh, with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from the people 
he has broken my covenant. Uh, move on down, if you will, to verse 22, and we'll read verse 22 down through verse 27 as it goes really uh, with this portion to tell us more about Abraham. And so verse 22 says, And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's, Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money uh, from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. And so in Abraham's name, we see he goes from Abram to Abraham here. Up until this point, he had always been called Abram, even though we've been referring to him uh, interchangeably between uh, the two different names. Abram literally means father of many. Abram means that, A-B-R-A-M. So think about it. He's been called Abram these 99 years. What a ridicule his name was because he only had one child. And yet his name means father of many. And, and, and that was the one that was by Sarah's servant named Hagar. But now God changes his name from Abram, meaning father of many, to Abraham, which literally means father of multitudes. So we see that God is expanding it even farther than his original name had meant. And so now this name must have been a mystery and a mockery to Abraham because he's 99 years old. I mean, think about Sarah. Sarah is 90 years old at this point. Both of them are far past the age of childbearing. I mean, I think we would agree that it takes real faith for a 100-year-old to marry a 90-year-old woman and then begin looking for a house next to an elementary school that we're going to have kids and we're going to raise kids at that age. And that's crazy to us. But that's exactly the kind of faith that, that, was demand, that God was demanding from Abraham. In fact, notice what God said back in verse 5. He said, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So notice how God says that. Let's read it one more time. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. And then notice he says, for I have made. Not I will make, but I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So as far as God is concerned, when he changes his name from Abram to Abraham, it's as good as done. The great missionary Hudson Taylor said, there are three stages in any work of God, impossible, difficult, and done. And as far as God was concerned, this was done. That's why he says there, I have made, past tense, it's already been done. It's already good as done. Uh, and he was saying to Abraham, he was saying, you can take it to the bank. God had promised Abraham that he would make him a, a great and mighty nation. Now, at the time, God promised Abraham this. Uh, he would have been way past the retirement age. Uh, he was uh, right at 100 years old here. Uh, he would have been drawing Social Security if he was in our days for, for 40 years or close to that. His wife, Sarah, uh, she wasn't any spring chicken either. Uh, she was 90 years old at this point. And to be blunt with it, uh, their get up and go had get up, got up and gone. And so Sarah, she had gotten to the age where, quite flank, frankly here, they needed a miracle for this covenant promise to happen, for his name to be fulfilled, or his name would never mean anything. And that would be uh, an even worse ridicule uh, upon him. And so up to this point, it has been. And, and so they needed a miracle. And that's exactly where God comes in. Well, we're going to... Uh, we realize and we need to realize from this passage this, morning, this evening that we serve a miracle-working God. The Bible says that Sarah did conceive. And Sarah did bear a son. 
His name was Isaac, and today there are over 15 million Jews on this planet, Israelites who inhabit this earth all because of the miraculous birth of a baby born to a 100-year-old father and a 90-year-old mother who dared to believe God for, for something that was impossible. So I want to tell you, if there is anybody on the face of the earth that ought to believe in a virgin birth, it's the Jews. Because just like every Christian owes our origin to a miracle birth of Jesus Christ, every Jew owes their origin to a miracle birth. Every Jew that you see walking the face of this earth today is a reminder of the awesome power of God working in and through Abraham and Sarah. But in Abraham, we also see a dedication of the promise of God. We see a dedication of the promise of God because when God makes a promise, he will move heaven and earth to fulfill that promise no matter how small, no matter how insignificant you might think it is. F.B. Meyer once said, he said, if any promise of God should fail, the heavens uh, would clothe themselves in sackcloth. The sun and the moon and the stars would reel from their courses, and the universe would rock and a hollow wind would moan through a ruined creation the awful message that God can lie if any of his promises were to fail. Our God is a God who cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 tells us that. So the promise that God makes here is both unprecedented and unrepeated. So notice that the promise is made to a specific person. The promise is made specifically to Abraham. Furthermore, it's made to a specific people. What did verse 7 say? Verse 7 said, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring. So there's a specific people in mind here. So this promise is made concerning the Jewish race. It's not for the, the, the Arabs. It's not for those who are in the Middle East outside of the Jewish people. Uh, because verse 21 tells us that. The promise wasn't to Ishmael. Uh, and the Arabs, it was to Isaac and the Jews. So it was to a specific people. It was also for a specific period. Because notice in, in verse 7, it's called an, an everlasting covenant. Uh, he says, I'll make this with your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant covenant. This promise is to be effective forever and ever and ever, but it's also for a specific place. Notice verse 8, and I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So now you, we might call it Israel or, or Palestine or the Holy Land, but whatever you choose to call it, the Bible is plain that the land belongs to the Jewish people. Furthermore, keep in mind that this promise is unconditional. That is, it's all of grace. They didn't have to do anything to gain the promise of this covenant. It's not only of grace, it's unchangeable. It's been planted in the concrete Word of God, and neither God nor His Word can change. Furthermore, it's unbreakable. Abraham may fail, but God's plan will never fail. Abraham may fall, but God will never fall. Abraham may forget, but God's promise won't. Because, of all, because all of the initiative, all of the intent, all of the uh, in, insistence of this promise comes from where? It comes from God. It comes from God, not from Abraham. Not what Abraham does or doesn't do or how he behaves or doesn't behave. It doesn't say, if you obey me, then I will do this. If you follow me, then I will do that. It just simply says, here's what I'm going to do to you. And it's all from God. Then we notice our third name, Sarah, in verse 15 down through verse 17. So God said to Abraham... As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. 
Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Now this third name, Sarah, Sarah uh, means princess. Now we, we don't know specifically what Sarai means. Some say it means to mock or to be contentious. But it probably, like Abrams, has some emphasis uh, of, 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 is another form of the word princess. Uh, since she would become, as the Bible tells us here, the mother of kings. Uh, it was only right that she be called a princess. So we need to be careful when we're looking at the story here uh, of, of the patriarchs here in the Old Testament that we don't minimize the place of Sarah in God's great plan of salvation. Because like her husband Abraham, and just like all of us, she had her faults. He had, her, had his faults, we have our faults, she had her faults. But also like her husband, she trusted God and she accomplished his purposes. She not only was not only the, the mother of the Jewish nation, she was also a good example uh, for, for even Christian wives today to follow. So the Christian husband ought to treat their wife like a princess because that's what they are in the Lord. At three different occasions uh, of laughter are associated with Isaac's birth. Here's one of them where Abraham laughed for joy when he heard his wife would give birth to the promised son. So when he laughs here, he's laughing out of joy uh, in verse 17. Sarah is going to laugh over in chapter 18. Uh, she's going to laugh over there in unbelief when she hears the news. And then Sarah is also going to laugh herself for joy when the child is born in Genesis chapter 21. Now the name Isaac, what do you think it means? He laughs. He laughs. You know, motherhood ought to be highly valued, and the birth of a baby ought to be welcomed with joy. And that's what you see in Isaac, that, that he was welcomed with joy. While God doesn't call every woman to marry or all married women to bear children, he does have a special concern both for mothers and for children. You know, all, all too often in our selfish society, too many people see motherhood as a barrier and children as a burden. In fact, some people consider children such a burden that they destroy them before they even have an opportunity to become a blessing. So we need to uplift children, and we need to uplift mothers. And what an example Sarah is for us, and for men, the way we ought to treat our wife as the princess that she is. Then you see the fourth name is Isaac. Isaac, we find him in verse 18 down to verse 21. So verse 18 says, And Abraham said to God, All that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. For, Ish, for as for Ishmael... I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So the first baby born in, in, in the first baby in the Bible who was named before birth was Ishmael. Uh, and, and the second was Isaac. Uh, later we'll see in Genesis chapter 21 that these two boys represent two different births. Ishmael are, are, represents our first birth after the flesh, and Isaac represents spiritually our second birth through the Spirit as we trust uh, by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So from the human point of view, you can understand why Abraham is interceding for Ishmael. How old is Ishmael at this point? 13. 14 maybe because Abraham just said he was 100 at this point. So he's somewhere in that time frame, 13, 14 years old. Ishmael is his son. Uh, 
And, and, and Abraham loved him dearly. He had spent some 13 years now with him as, as Ishmael is entering into adulthood. And, and so the question was coming to Abraham is, is God going to waste all that I've invested in, in Ishmael? Was there to be no future for him after all? It, it wasn't Ishmael's fault that he was born. It was Abraham and Sarah who sinned, not the boy. But from the spiritual point of view, Ishmael could not replace Isaac or even be equal to him in the covenant plan of God. Now, we're going to see that play out in the birth of future children in the, in the genealogical line here from Abraham. Uh, but he, he could not be equal with Isaac uh, in part of this covenant plan of God. God had already promised to bless Ishmael back in chapter 16, and he will keep that promise when we get to it over in Genesis chapter 25. But the covenant blessings were not to be a part of Ishmael's heritage. Isaac alone was to be the heir of all things. And there's a practical lesson here for everyone who seeks to live by faith. Here's the lesson. When God is preparing a bright future for you, don't cling to the things of the past. Ishmael represented the past. Isaac represented the future. Ishmael symbolized man's fleshly way of accomplishing something for God because that's what they did. They took matters into their own hands, acted in the flesh to try to fix the problem so that they could be the father and the mother of, of many people, of multitudes. And that was the sin that they committed. That's what Ishmael represents, the fleshly way of accomplishing something for God. But here's Isaac who's a miracle baby. He's born by the power of God. Uh, nothing they did to fix the situation. It was directly from God. And so Ishmael, we're going to find out, brings dissension in the home. But Isaac, what does he bring? He brings laughter. Here's one thing we need to realize also from this. If you have an Ishmael in your life, surrender it up to God. Because God has a perfect plan, and what he plans is the best. It may pain us to give up our cherished dreams, but God's way is always the right way. A Amy Carmichael, missionary to India, she wrote to a friend who was perplexed about, her painful, about a painful experience, and she said, this is what she wrote back to her, she said, I will say what our Heavenly Father said to me long ago and says to me still very often, see in it, this painful experience you're going through, see in it a chance to die. Perhaps we all need to pray, she said, all oh, that Ishmael might die within me. Ishmael didn't get a new name because he represents the flesh, and the flesh can't be changed. John chapter 3, verse 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and it will always be flesh. Romans 7, 18 says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. John chapter 6 and verse 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, Jesus said. So the old nature of, of our lives can be disciplined, it can be subdued, it can even to some extent be controlled, but it can't be changed. Until we receive our glorified bodies in the presence of the Lord, the struggle is always going to be there between the flesh and the spirit. And that's always going to continue. Here in Abraham and Sarah and Isaac's life, it was a new beginning. Because Sarah was going to have a baby boy. John chapter 8 and verse 56, here's what Jesus said. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So what's in a name? Here's what we need to realize overall from this message in chapter 17. We need to realize that there's a name above every other name. That's a precious name. It's a powerful name. It's even a saving name. It's a conquering name. It's an eternal name. It's the name of Jesus. 
Think about this. When the smallest child whispers the name of Jesus in their nighttime prayers beside their little tiny bed, every demon on earth trembles in absolute fear. Not because of that child, but because of the name of Jesus. When that name is whispered from the lips of those who are sick and those who are suffering, then a peace that passes all understanding comes to the heart of the hurting. Mention that name, which is above every other name, and immediately fear begins to vanish and faith is born. The black clouds of sorrow are forced to roll away and new life begins to burst forth because of the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. What's in a name? When you mention the name of Jesus, there's forgiveness for the unforgivable. There's love for the unlovable. There is mercy for the merciless. And there is hope for the hopeless. His name is above every name. He is our joy. He is our hope. He is our salvation. His name is a saving name. In fact, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 tells us in our salvation experience that for every one who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's coming a day when the voice of Jesus is going to raise those who are dead in Christ. And those who are alive and remain in Christ are going to meet him in the air and be with him forever. That is our hope. His is a name above every name. So remember the name of Abraham. Remember the name of Sarah. Remember the name of Isaac, but more than that, remember the name of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember the name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. What a powerful passage here of hearing and seeing these names and beginning to understand what they mean and how they apply to this passage and to these individuals' lives. Lord, there are many of us who are here tonight, some who are maybe watching online. We profess the name of Christ. We say it with our lips that, that I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. But all too often, it's empty words because there is no relationship in the heart. There is no demonstration of the change and transformation that's happened in our lives through the blood of Jesus Christ, through our actions and our deeds. Father, we understand that we're not saved by the things we do, but the things we do leave a trail, leave an evidence of the faith that we profess with our lips. And so, Father, I pray tonight that our names that we profess to be, that we profess to be a Christian, Lord, I pray that we would live up to that name. And the only way we can live up to that name, we can't do it in and of ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Lord, there are those who may be here or watching online who they've never trusted by faith in Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, and they need the Holy Spirit within their lives. And the only way to do that, as the Bible has told us even in these verses, is to call upon the name of the Lord which means that you surrender to him. You believe in what he did for you, that he died on the cross in your place, that he was buried in the tomb and gives you a free gift that you have to receive of eternal life, that he, as, as he arose from the grave, so will you. You will receive an eternal life through the precious blood of Christ. So, Father, I pray tonight that there would be those who would call out to Jesus and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe in what Jesus did for me, on the cross and I trust in his resurrection and the price that he paid for me and I ask him to come into my life to save me and to help me to live for him all the days of my life Lord if there's someone who's prayed something like that in their hearts tonight or even online Lord may they confess that may they come Lord uh, in this invitation or there online if they'll just comment so we can follow up with them father we pray for your will to be done in their lives father we pray for many believers Lord would we live up to the name of Christ. What's in a name? What's in the name we profess? 
the name that is above every other name, the only name that we can be saved by, and that is Jesus Christ. So help us to live for Jesus each and every day by the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do the impossible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we stand, as we sing our hymn of invitation, let Jesus come into your heart. Would you come tonight as the Lord lays on your heart? Would you respond there online as the Lord lays to you? As we stand, as we sing. Would you come, brother? If you are tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your if you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come into your heart. Just now your doubtings give forth. Just now reject him no more. Just now open the door. Let Jesus come. Didn't want to have you sing all those verses. <laughs> Some are wanting to get to a game. Uh, but so glad you joined us. So glad those of you came here uh, in person also. Uh, look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, 5.30 for Awana, 6 o'clock for our worship time in here and our prayer meeting time. So come and join us in person if you at all can. Uh, it'll be a wonderful blessing for you as you do. We'll be in the book of Zechariah in the last chapter, Zechariah chapter 14, as we finish that wonderful book. So come and join us uh, Wednesday night for that. But you stay safe, have a blessed week, and we'll see you this Wednesday.